uh, I want to thank Ken and everyone at USG for inviting me to do this. Um, and I'm just so excited to see so many of my favorite people out here and also some of my students and former students and former teachers and it's just um, filling me with a lot of joy. Um, and I also want to say a special shout out to my family who throughout the book have supported and inspired me and they're here today and it's just really nice to have you all here. Um, and uh, yeah, feeling, I'm feeling it in here. Um, so some of you have read the book, some of you have not, some of you um, have read parts of it. Uh, and I'm sure that for some folks, you, when I say transformative teaching and transformative <coughs> teacher, that you're not quite sure what I'm talking about. <laughs> so what I want to do a little bit today is, is kind of explain to you what that term means, and that's kind of as an introduction to our conversation. But before I get to that explanation, I do need to tell you a story, uh, a little story about myself. Um, and so and this story came to me as I was preparing for this talk. Uh, and uh, I was thinking back to the first book talk that I ever went to myself. And I was 20 years old, I was in college, and I was thinking about being a teacher. Um, I was very kind of excited about this idea, and I decided I was going to go to a book talk uh, with Jonathan Kozel. And I see a lot of nods. There's some folks who know him. If you don't, you know, he's mostly known for his book called Savage Inequalities. There's a couple other books similar to that. And his, uh, his books are very, very much around the inequalities that are in our school system. Um, and he calls some of these, these inequalities what he calls American apartheid. Um, and so he's right. There is, um, there it was and there still is um, serious inequalities in our school um, at, in systems of education. Um, well, so I was there at this book talk, excited. I was there to, he's kind of like my, one of my uh, education idols, and I was, you know, this is it, right? I'm gonna, he's gonna drop the knowledge on it. Um, and he kind of appeared tired. He was tired, and he talked about the problems in education, and he shared some beautiful stories of some of the children but overall, what I got out of it in that moment was just that we have problems. Um, and, you know, I said to myself, I know we have problems, um, but I am a college student. I'm excited to teach. Is, should I even go there? Is this something I should do? You know, what could I do? Is there anything I can do? Um, so, you know, I've always been kind of an optimistic but pragmatic person. And so when I see a problem, I want to fix it. Um, but this talk that he gave left me really struggling. Um, and I was struggling for this vision of possibility. Um, so that is not what this event is about, and that is not what this book is about. This book, um, I like to, I'll pull in a, um, a someone, someone who, some of you may be familiar with, a teacher in Philadelphia named Amy Rote. She's, uh, organized with the Caucus of Working Educators. Uh, talking with her, she said, in order to make change, in order to organize, you need three things. You need anger, hope, and a plan. Mm. Okay? No. So Kozol gave me the anger, and this book is meant to give us hope and a plan. Right? Um, so the goal here was to tell stories. Um, the true stories of real teachers organizing for change and change that brings greater equity, social justice within the classroom, uh, to show teachers and the world not only what's possible, but what's happening now. Um, and to hope that the young and idealistic teachers or folks who haven't even decided to be teaching yet, but might be reading this, uh, won't work, walk away with just fear and anger, but with some hope and possibility um, in the world. And the experienced teacher will also maybe walk away with some new possibilities. Um, and, you know, I stayed up all night last night following the news, the crazy news cycle, <laughs> um, and I kept on thinking, boy, we, like, we really need this. We're in this like very devastating time in our history. You know, we have a secretary of education who pretty much doesn't want public education to exist. Uh, we have a Congress that you know is gutting health care and all kinds of other supports. Um, we, I don't want to go to the president. Uh, it's very easy to lose hope. 
very easy. Um, but in my opinion, the only thing that's going to give us hope is to raise up the stories of the people who are transforming education for good. Um, so, and I think that these stories are actually often hidden. We, we do like to, t to focus on the bad stuff in the news and in, even in ed education research. Um, there are very few books in education today that tell stories of teachers as change makers. Um, and, uh, and that's a problem because when the model doesn't exist, then there's a very low likelihood that it's legitimized and taught, taught to future teachers. Um, now there's a second aspect to this book. You saw the in a connected world piece, right? Um, and so there's this role of social media and technology. Um, I don't think anybody here can dispute that social media and technology is playing a, world, a role in our world, uh, from politics to political, per, to personal connections and, you know. But I want to make something really clear. I'm not the person to hype a tool and not even a person to hype technology. What I'm interested in is how organi is organizing democratic participation, working for educational equity, and how connected technologies shape the culture of these practices. So I don't think we can stick our heads in the sand and pretend that the technologies uh, don't fundamentally shape a lot of the way we interact. Um, so I think that we as teachers and as organizers and advocates, uh, we need to have a critical literacy of these tools and so that we can fight for the future. Um, so I'm telling these stories of teachers that fight for social justice, who understand how to navigate and connect in this time. Um, and I'm telling these stories because um, I want to offer hope and a plan. Um, so back to transformative teaching. <laughs> that was my really long story. Um, so I think you're ready for it now, now that you've got a little history of me. And um, I'm just going to read the opening couple paragraphs of my book because they actually um, tell a story and they also tell you what I mean by transformative teaching. So let me do a little reading. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, and that might get you into wanting to read more afterwards. <laughs> so the book starts with a quote by Grace Lee Boggs, who was an educator, educational activist, civil rights activist, and she said, we never know how our small activities will affect others through the invisible fabric of our connectedness. In this exquisitely connected world, it's never a question of critical mass. Dramatic and systematic change always begins with critical connections. Okay, that's the quote. So in 2010, I met a teacher who helped to initiate a change in my understanding of transformative te teacher learning and leadership in the digital age. That teacher is Samuel Reed III, and he's here today. <laughs> um, allow me to introduce you to him. I try my best. Uh, Reed is a middle school, oh, high school, high school teacher now at the U School, public school, a public school in Philadelphia. He maintains a regular blog column with a public school notebook, independent. How many people know the notebook? Good. <laughs> Independent education news program. In his blog, he writes frequently about the work in the field in his classroom, often advocating for the idea of, quote, flipping the script, challenging others to see the strengths of his students and his school community rather than focusing on the deficits. Reed has leadership roles in at least three or four different teacher-led professional development networks in Philadelphia. He hosts poetry slams for his students and community members, has received grant funding for his summer program, Boys Right Now, in which boys in grades 7 through 12 write together and produce essays or poetry for competitions. He's partnered with other teacher network leaders uh, to develop proposals for policies and activities that promote <coughs> teacher-led professional development, and another person in this room also helped with him with that. Um, and those, those policies have affected a lot of um, school district uh, uh, policies. I'm sorry, that work has affected some school district policies, or policies around professional development. Uh, Reed is an active, avid van, fan of Twitter. If you follow him, you'll see him tweeting frequently, engaging with news reporters and scholars about work that he or others, other teachers are doing. Reed is difficult to miss. He, is an active, he has, has a very active presence, um, both online and in person and in professional networks. He is, as Grace Lee Boggs said, 
critically connected with members of his personal and professional networks. Reed and the communities in which he has played a leadership role have made a profound impact on education in Philadelphia. Reed epitomizes a contemporary transformative teacher. He is passionate, public, intellectual, committed to pursuing social justice and equity for all students through his craft. He uses digital era cultural tools such as making, hacking, and connecting to design, organizing, and lead collective efforts to grow teacher knowledge and agency. Reed is a part of a new wave of teacher-led networked social movements in education that are transforming the concept of a teacher from that of an isolated, passive, technical worker to connected, socio-politically active, knowledge-building agent of change, and in turn, taking the lead in shaping the cultures and practices of contemporary teaching and learning. So in this book, I describe transformative teaching in three ways. First, I tell the stories of several transformative teachers, a lot from Philly, um, and offer a kind of a developmental framework that highlights key characteristics of transformative teaching and leadership. Second, I describe those digital era cultural tools of making, hacking, and connecting. And these are practices that teachers use collectively to make change. And by the way, if you're, uh, the idea of hacking, we might talk about that a little later, I'm using that term in a different sense than the term that some of you may associate it with, which is this computer hacking. That's not the, ter the way that I'm using that, that term. Not like, not yeah. like yes, it's not that kind of hacking. We'll get, we'll get to that. Um, so they're using those practices to collectively work for change and to unify and create collective power. Um, and third, I describe how organizations can support transformative teachers. I highlight stories of organizations, three in particular, uh, the Teacher Networks in Initiative in the Philadelphia Ed, Ed Fund, the EdCamp Foundation, and the Connected Learning Initiatives and the National Writing Project. So I actually had about 20 more minutes of talking, but I decided I'd cut it. <laughs> I'm going to get straight to the chase here. Um, I'm, my hope with this book is that you walk away from this conversation when we ha start talking um, with a little, and walk away from the book with a little more energies and a little more ideas. And so that is why I'm going to just end it here. Um, and I'm going to have some conversation with you, Kent, and then we're going to open it up. Because uh, today we are, in fact, um, engaging in a hack. This is a hack. <laughs> uh, this is a hack of the discourse of teaching. So many of you didn't realize that you were in a hack right now. Uh, what we're going to do is together we're systematically thinking about social justice and teaching in this connected world, and we'll do a little problem solving and thinking about how to improve it. So that is pretty much the, my definition of it. We'll kind of talk a little about that more. Um, last thing I want to mention uh, is that my next big mission is to transform teacher education itself. And I know that sounds a little bit overreaching, <laughs> but I'd have some funds from um, the Blankley Endowment and Arcadia, so I'm running a Transformative Teacher Educator Fellowship. So if you're a teacher educator and you're interested in that, please ask me. Uh, I'd be help happy to share that information with you, and we'll work and make some real change together. Onward. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to start on a personal note that I think, um, well, obviously we have a lot of people in, in the audience with a lot of knowledge and experience, um, and uh, your work matters so much to us personally. Uh, we do want to give a, I do want to give a shout out to your parents who are here, Judy and Carl, and your husband, John, and your son, Jules. Would you guys all stand up in the row back there? Because I know they're so proud of you. Aww. and. Um, <laughs> You, uh, it, it means so much to them. My, my parents were teachers for different parts of their career. My wife is a teacher. Um, I know it just goes on and on in the way this kind of appreciative inquiry telling the good stories to build on them matters. So I thank you for the work. I know your colleagues are at Arcadia. Appreciate you. We appreciate you at the, ch at the church here. Um, okay, so let's, let's dive in. Um, 
Let's do go over a couple of your definitions. Jason and I have been talking about them. We're excited by them. Um, when you talk about hacking, you're not talking about the stuff that Robert Mueller is looking at in his investigation. So what do you? what is hacking? I think you just said it, but could you reiterate? Yeah, yeah I'll talk about it a little bit. So, you know, hacking, the term hacking has come uh, from where it, you know, it, it derives from computer programmers. Um, but since then, it's, the term itself has evolved a lot. Uh, what's interesting is what I had to do a lot in understanding some of these terms, the terms that a lot of the teachers I talk to it use and then sometimes don't even use but kind of use the principles of, mm -hmm. is I had to trace way back to kind of the origins to get a real understanding. So first thing that I learned is that um, the original hackers were actually just the original coders, like co folks who coded and wanted to share information with each other to figure out how to solve problems, they were hackers. Now, you're talking about computers? I'm going back. I'm going way back to the origin of the term. So yeah, so they were. And then somebody started doing some bad stuff. And these guys, you know, it, it, it started to get a little sketchy. But this, this idea of understanding the power structures of some system mm -hmm. and working together in some way and often in a public way to, um, to figure out how those power structures operate and then change the system, which is essentially what those early coders were doing, that idea morphed as we all started doing what the coders were doing, which is connecting through technology. So those early coders, they were the only ones who could like instant message people because they were the only ones in there. All of a sudden, all of us were able to instant message and things like that. And we're doing some of the same stuff. We're like problem solving together in this public space, right? And thinking about what's going on power wise and things like that. So what's interesting to me, as I was reading this literature about this evolving idea of what hacking was and how people were using the term, people were using hacking like I'm going to hack my, I'm going to do a life hack and I'm going to like figure out how to fix my kitchen tool or something like that. They're using this hack in a really interesting way. Um, I also was reading literature on organizing, community organizing. And the literature on community organizing was saying, Understand the system of power. Understand who's in, you know, who are the stakeholders. Work collectively and build power together to figure out how to address and solve those problems creatively. And I had this kind of aha moment when I realized actually hacking is in some ways a form of organizing. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, the folks who are taking up this term and the taking up the principles of this term are in fact being organizers. Mm -hmm. um, and one, the key kind of principles of it were that using kind of a public space to kind of think through problems, right? Because that invites participation from a variety of different people, right? Um, that you are identifying uh, what people, what the problem is and the kind of different pieces of that problem is. And that you are kind of finding a way, a creative way to solve that. So for teachers, I'll give you a good example of what that might look like. Um, actually, in the book, one of the nice examples was um, this problem of Islamophobia, uh, which um, uh, is prevalent, right? Uh, one of the teachers found that that was an issue in her school, and several other teachers did that were working in a similar network. So they decided that collectively they were going to organize a trans, um, a Islamophobia forum, and they invited Muslim students to share their life stories to kind of humanize. Right? And they created this public space for sharing those stories. They used social media to like, can I share, you know, to kind of create that conversation. And the effect of that was they hacked the discourse of Islamophobia. They changed some of the ways that we're thinking about it and they pushed against it, right? So that's why I said this is a hack, because in some ways we're using a public space. We're reaching beyond this if you're using this, right? We're pushing into a conversation about what it means to be a transformative teacher, what we need in education now. Um, and hopefully as, as we bring more voices in, we'll, uh, we'll do that collectively, right? And I'm hoping that the conversation will keep going even after this, right? That the ha hashtag lives on and the conversation lives on. Right. So. 
in your book, you look at teachers from different parts of the country with a high percentage of Philadelphia. So I know you've become somewhat expert on some of the things that are happening in Philly. Can you say some more of what's new, exciting, working in our beloved city? Um, so you have to, again, I feel like I'm a historian here because, you know, we're, we, the, this, this school reform commission has, which has been in power and is a non-democratically elected school, school board, um, is just eliminated, right? But it's been in power for like 20 some odd years. And um, since it was put, installed by the uh, a governor long, long way ago, it, and a lot of these changes that kind of happened as a result, it also pushed various stakeholders to do organizing, mm -hmm. okay? So we've become actually really good and in the education community at organizing because of all because you have you know the resistant no, let's just say the resistance started early <laughs> for for educators in and and you know they've been been become uh powerful in that way so what was interesting for me in in, in writing this book is because there was such a deep seated uh, network and or organization and, and, and work around that in Philadelphia and in, in around education, um, I was able to like really get this kind of complex understanding and of, of how um, people work for change. And I think the election of Helen Gim is a good example of uh, lots of voices coming to the fore and organizing around um, issues in education and and you know she was a community organizer before then and involved in a lot of these groups and she got so there's direct political change as a result of not just organizing by teachers but um, but teachers but there are very, there are a lot of teachers that are part of that mm -hmm. and I would say you know the interesting development of the um, caucus of working educators which is a caucus in the um, uh, the teachers union um, but it cre it was created in part because there were a co collective of people who really wanted to talk about social justice and couldn't figure out how to get it in the main agenda. So then they created this, they created their own, right? Um, so I guess uh, I, I would say that Philadelphia is um, just a really powerful um, story about organizing and continues to be. and. Um, and I, that's one of the reasons I am in also, always in awe of the work that um, many of the organizers do to uh, change things. Yeah, I, I agree. And we, yep, we see that in this church, in these neighborhoods around here too. So I, I agree and we owe a lot to them and to find ways to support them, which I think is partly what your book's about. Um, I wanna go a little different direction with the digital um, social media part of transformative teachers. There, um, the, the balance between the personal and the social media can be tough to manage for people um, with time demands um, and so many tasks to do. So uh, this is something that comes up in religious professionals and ministers as well, how to balance it out when we find the need to be out there in social media more and more. Do you see any, do you see teachers going too far and in, in, in living too much in social media and not having enough real personal one-on-one -on -one relationships and conversations? I would say that what I've learned is that the use of connected technologies as a tool for organizing can only work with really powerful face-to-face -face relationship wow. building. Um, it can amplify uh, work and it can create opportunities for more people to participate um, and it can help you connect with folks but um, that it just there have been some um, movements and conversations that have happened purely in digital spaces, um, but the interesting thing is when they do, um, they often lead to face-to-face -face <laughs> relationships and networks, and so it becomes that, like, we, we, seek, we seek the personal, right? Um, I, I think there's another piece of your question, which is this, um, you know, how 
uh, technology that's meant to connect us sometimes make us feel more disconnected, right? right. And I struggled with that in, in asking myself that question, like, what's going on here? What's the difference between organizing and making a, an, um, making a collective organization or network of teachers stronger through the use of that versus making people feel isolated? And what I noticed and realized is it comes it seemed to come from the, the key goal of the organizers themselves. So if the goal, all of the teachers in my book, uh, their goal was to build relationships, not to get followers, right? Um, and it was to build relationships and help to solve problems often of practice, right? So um, I talked to a teacher in New York City named Jose Luis Wilson, who um, is pretty well known uh, for some of his blogging and, and things like that. And you know, he often he talked a lot about um, how um, he does. He thinks it, it's a real mistake to kind of be out in social media just to kind of be popular because it makes you actually feel disconnected. And that he always kind of approaches it by figuring out how to connect with folks. Another teacher. Um, I remember talking to uh, who was who uh, started the Eng uh, the English chat um, Twitter chat, which has been going on for many many years and has a lot of people involved. She just simply started because she had a question. She didn't know how to answer and she needed help, so she sought those out. So it wasn't about you know can I uh, should I be using this tool? It ne like starting with that question never really helps. Mm -hmm. Starting with the um, Seeking ways to build relationships to solve problems seems to be the the way to kind of leverage that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One, one thing we I, I believe it's true that as we are sort of headquarters or the epicenter for Facebook Nation, I think Facebook hit two billion people in the world now. Um, in America, with this hyper connectivity, many. Surveys show that people have less quality relationships and friendships than in the last 60 years. So we're more connected in some ways than ever, and more lonely. And that, and like I said, it you doesn't know, mean abandon the technology. It right. just means stick with the goals and the purpose. And the I think that the or, the religious organizations, the, the schools, the organizations have to help us figure out what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, you know, and that, I hate to like bring, you know, the, one of the interesting things that you said, um, you know, this book is connected to my first book. My first book was on, it was called The Networked Teacher, and it was about how teachers build profession, professional networks face to face. There was nothing about online in that book. And it was based off of a study, I looked at new teachers and at their experiences in building support networks, right? And what was interesting is that there were these new teachers, when they were trying to build support networks outside of their local context, people who didn't know really what was happening for them, like they would, read, they would go on Facebook or they'd go on Twitter, they never felt fully the kind of support they needed mm -hmm. versus the teachers who made it their job to like be, you know, collaborate with people in their school. All, they, they were pushed into like, leadership positions that they wanted to do, you know, they, they felt supported, they felt like they got, and one of the things, after I kind of pondered this, what's going on, is I realized that you need to actually be strategic in how you build networks, and you have to understand how networks work themselves. So if you want social and emotional support, you need to build support close by. If you need new ideas and break out of like your little silo, you need to reach out, right? And so to understand that like it's not a panacea, it's the networks are not a panacea, and then also how to really constructively think about, okay, I'm in a place right now where I'm feeling bored, I don't really have any ideas, maybe it's time for me to seek some support outside of the bubble that I'm in and, you know, and, and find some connections outside of that versus I just, I don't even know how this school works. I'm going to see, talk to the teacher next door and see if we can collaborate on something so that I can get to know them better. That right? sounds great. So that ties into this a lot. I mean, that, this book built on my les the lessons I learned from that to some extent. Do you, do you have any uh, funny stories for us 
like I was, I was just listening to the song today. This is connected. This is a related thought, people. Trust me. Um, you know the song, If You Like Pina Colada <laughs> and Getting Caught in the Rain? It eventually comes into their writing to each other in a newspaper, and they're going to cheat on each other from their, uh, wed their marriage, but that's gonna, they're going to cheat with each other. Yeah. And they didn't know it. But you got any stories like this from social media and the teachers or not necessarily people cheating on each other in there? <laughs> but it seems like crazy stuff has to be happening in all this. Well, yeah, I mean, social media is crazy. I had to spend a lot of, a lot of time on social media to understand, like, how it was being used, how, what kinds of conversations. Um, and uh, I would say the funniest kind of moments I had, there was a group called the Badass Teachers. Okay, and <laughs> they are really skilled at just being kind of funny in order to get people to pay attention nice. to the issues. Nice. And they would also oftentimes like hijack or hack um, hashtags that are being used by other, like, uh, so some some official that they thought was doing something wrong might tweet something and use a hashtag and then they would take it and they would hijack it and make him look like an idiot. So, you know, like, they were very, um, they were badass. That's know? nice. I like it. I think maybe we could start a <laughs> badass are. pastors. Um, <laughs> um, Am I allowed to say uh, that here? <laughs> all right, I want to... <laughs> I, I have a lot more questions, but I'm aware of the time, too, so I want to invite my colleague Jason up here, see if he wants to um, ask some questions from the seat. Jason and Kira work together. They're the two top leaders of our children's spiritual development team, which, for which we are very fortunate. Oh, hi. Thank you, Kent. Hi, Kira. Hi. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like Kent was saying, uh, Kira and I work together uh, at this church, and um, I just can't say how awesome it is to have like somebody that's so accomplished and uh, like doing volunteer grassroots work here as the chair of our children's spiritual development program. So we have the opportunity to collaborate and try to like revision what religious education looks like. And it's funny because we've been working together for, what, like a year now? And uh, I just read the book uh, this weekend, and, like, I didn't even realize, like, we're hacking religious education. <laughs> <laughs> so this whole time, like, <laughs> now I have new language to put to it. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, we, we've been having a lot of fun, and uh, in terms of like the, the hacking that we're doing is we've been creating uh, these teacher workshops, and they're going to turn into parent workshops as well, so that we can begin to get beyond this concept of, like I think religious education too often falls into... Um, uh, Friere's banking model of education where, uh, see, the thing is, is so we're dealing with volunteer educators most of the time, people who don't have a lot of experience in the teaching field. So in some sense, it's important to give them a detailed lesson plan and curriculum, but that oftentimes leads to a situation where it's the adult who is sort of seen as the authority or having the knowledge and then, you know, imparting it on, onto the child. And so what we've been doing is trying to, through these workshops, trying to show the parent volunteers and other um, adult volunteers that um, being in the classroom with the child is a mutually uh, beneficial uh, educational experience and that it's not just the child who's learning and growing but it's also the adult who's learning and growing and so um, so we're hacking it yeah. and uh, uh, so I, I'm feeling very comfortable with that notion I think if I've uh, through that example would you say that I've explained the idea of hacking pretty pretty clearly mm -hmm. 
Um, the one thing that I do have a question on is um, you talk about maker spaces mm -hmm. and the idea of the teacher being a maker. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, some of the examples that you gave in the book uh, are really associated a lot of times with high tech and STEM education. So these fab labs mm -hmm. and um, coding classes and things like that. And that got me thinking about, well, first it got me thinking to the past. Like, so, so my first question is, is that sort of an evolution of what we saw in the past as like the art class, wood shop, metal class, auto class, um, you know, any of these participatory environments where kids are like working on problems with the teacher and producing something new, possibly something genuine. Yeah. Um, so is there a relationship there? That's my first question. That my second question is um, a sort of a parallel so if we if we looking at stem education and we move over to social sciences education or literature or religious education um how does that how does that look as a maker space can that concept be applied to to those areas of education as well okay so um this is really good questions. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a poll. Has, who here has heard maker space before that term? Okay, a, a good couple. And, and what about just the term maker? Okay, a few. Okay, so um, it's an interesting phenomenon. The, um, I had to do a lot of tracing back with that term too, right? Um, and there's these interesting parallel tracks um, happening with that, with the idea of making a maker space. We go back to those parallel tracks. The first track are the, what, the DIY folks, um, the folks that are really interested, the community that's really interested in pr being producers, not just consumers, right? And you can go all the way back to the whole Earth catalog and the, you know, the, um, the, which is, you know, 1960s, 70s, and beginnings of 80s. Um, but, you know, you guys have been watching it, all these TV shows and things, people are really interested in the DIY kind of thing. Well, you know, that, became um, more uh, engaging to people because not only do they, the folks that are interested in the making um, and doing the DIY uh, get more technology, but they were actually now with connected technologies can teach each other. So I don't know about you guys, and I hate to put Jules on the spot here, but there's a whole lot of YouTube videos out there made by kids, for kids, about how to make things. Right? Okay? That is essentially the culture, a, a culture of making, right? That I am not just sitting here buying the products, but in fact, I am a producer myself. I have opinions about the things that somebody else did, and I'm going to show you also some ideas of how to make something myself, right? So there's this really interesting culture of making that's been happening all like and evolving as we've gotten these new technologies. At the same time, you know, when I was in school, we did have shop, okay? I think I was the last generation to have shop. And there's been this gap in school where it just got thrown away. None of those making kind of activities. And <laughs> it really affected kids and teachers, right? So all of a sudden, this idea of like making, which is in part of kind of enculturated into us a little bit too, um, and be, and, and this idea of a maker space, which was, you know, is what they call sometimes a, um, a maker gym. You literally could go to these spaces that you, you pay like a monthly fee and can make whatever you want, right? That idea really appealed to educators, right? Because there's no shop classes anymore. There's no home economics. There's none of that. So in some ways, um, in a very smart move, T educators said, okay, so like making is a thing now and people are like really excited about making and makerspace. Let's figure out, that's pretty much, you know, progressive education, right? Just having a space where people can be producers and make an experiment and it's okay to fail and all that kind of stuff. So they took that into this school place spaces, right? And I would say there are makerspaces that don't have any technology at all. And there are makerspaces 
that, have, that are all about their 3D printer and what can you make. But the core of it is this idea of both being producers and sharing and teaching other people what you're doing, right? And I would say an, another part of that culture is this idea of understanding design process, that you're always iterating and you're always thinking about um, what are the needs, ha, ha, empathizing with the folks that you're making stuff for, right? You're trying to understand who they are. That's another kind of piece of that. So does that help? Like, to see how those two intersect? I yeah. Did a lot of history research on that. Yeah, that's yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Um, and so then the, the second piece of that question was, um, does it translate? Into oh, the, so, oh, yes. Into, so, into, um, if, I don't know if there's any history of social studies to teachers, but like the problem-based learning and project-based learning, uh, the idea of inquiry, it crosses every discipline and that's at the core inquiry is essentially starting with a question or a problem and quote, going through a design kind of process to figure out how to uh, address that problem right so whether or not you are doing that in a physical way or you're doing that in a you know it, working through what you have you, you're still that that still can be a, a core piece I would also say though like like I said the key to like the making ideology, the making mindset is that you are, you have some agency, right? That you're not just getting information and the receiver of information. So it's very antithetical to that idea of the banking, right? Mm -hmm. That you're actually a knowledgeable contributor and that you're going to contribute something that you have made into the wide world of what you're making, of what's out there. So. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, so I think at this time we're going to open it up to more of a dialogue, and uh, I'm not sure how we want to do that. Should I pass the mic around? Is, okay. So um, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm realizing that I know these two teachers in Detroit who, who I would consider uh, transformative in the sense that they're transforming how you think about education um, in terms of what they're doing. What they're doing is they're taking high school kids and they're making them the teachers. Um, <laughs> And so this incredible web happens where you have high school kids teaching middle school kids, and these high school kids eventually grow up to be college kids who teach the, the new high school kids. You have this incredible web of connections of people being mentors, college kids being mentors to high school kids, and high school kids being mentors to, to um, middle school kids. This incredible connection, a web of connection, and what happens is there's a culture of, of love and compassion that develops and this, this culture allows trauma to be healed. Um, and that's why I think it's so transformative. It's, it's like, instead of me, the teacher, being the, the bank of knowledge, I tell my high school kids, you be the teachers. You discover how to teach these middle school kids. You develop these connections. Um, and then, and then love, and and love in this container of healing trauma happens. So I'm just sort of struck by that model. Yeah, I mean, what, what, I, what I heard that kind of connected with some of the thoughts here um, was that idea of um, the positioning of the teacher. Um, and that's one of the things I talk about a lot is when I'm interviewing uh, folks for this book, uh, a lot of them use this word co-learner. Teacher is a co-learner, right? Um, that, and that they're positioning themselves as a learner with the student, um, and they're finding ways to empower students because if, if your goal is social justice and equity, then you're understanding um, that you want to help young people see, uh, develop their voice and their power and their agency now, right? So, um, and so that's a kind of key piece of it, yeah. Um, and I would say, I, you know, I'm going to kind of drift a little bit here. Um, one of the things that I think we often forget in education is that the reason that we decided as a country many, many hundreds of years ago to have public education was not because we needed jobs. The reason we decided to have a public education is because we needed people who knew how to vote, right? Who actually were informed enough as citizens to be able to make choices that made sense, that, that th th made, make informed choices, right? And so what we've been kind of trained to do uh, or to think over the years is that education is for jobs. And it is 
in some, some, some way, there is, you know, you certainly want to prepare kids for the, for careers and things like that. But if you start from education being about skills and jobs, and you ignore education for democracy, then you are also kind of, what you're doing is that you're not, prepare, you're, you're not preparing kids for making those kinds of important choices. And I think, unfortunately, we've seen yeah. what has happened when we've convinced ourselves that education is for jobs and not that education is for educating citizen, like developing citizens and a sense of citizenry. Um, so, and it's, it's sad, but I, let's keep transforming, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, I have really bad allergies, but, um, so my name is Ami Patel Hopkins and I know Kira from my work when I was at the Philadelphia Education Fund, um, and Sam too. So did a lot of work with organizing teacher networks with that face-to-face -face contact that Kira mm -hmm. mentioned. So when you just said the position of the teacher and what you just said around trauma and mm -hmm. healing, um, I think by necessity a lot of these networks, because at the Ed Fund we did research around in-school networks and out-of-school networks, um, Philadelphia has like 20 plus out of school networks. So by necessity, because of the trauma going on with what's happening at the governance level or what's happening with the funding issue, these teachers are coming together and I really see it as a way of teachers staying in the classroom and being connected. So mm -hmm. from the trauma piece that you mentioned and then the position of the teacher thinking about professional development and the teacher voice in professional development, that, um, that quote around Sam and mm -hmm. the, um, how teachers play a role in their own professional development. So another thing we worked on at the Ed Fund was professional development, ongoing, responsive, and collaborative. Um, that's like the, the three pillars of professional development. And, um, and really, as a leader, I, I don't know how many educators are in the room today, but y you can apply that to so many different you know, in the workplace, in the school. So I just wanted to make a statement about that. But, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, would, I have to say, um, what Ami said about the, the teachers taking the lead in their own professional development, and in not just their own, but in professional development at large, is incredibly important to um, the teaching profession. Because if you think about... Um, other professions, legal, the legal profession, the medical for profession, I don't know if I could think of any other. All of those professions, the knowledge base comes from the professionals in that profession and the accreditation and rules that are set about what's expected comes from the people in that profession, right? You think about uh, the, if you're a lawyer, the bar association, that bar association is made up of lawyers, right? Teaching is the only profession where other people are making the decisions about what is important knowledge, about how you should be trained, about what the accreditation is, and because of that, teaching is at, right now in kind of, unless we are able to push forth and kind of, uh, as teachers, push into and own this sense of professionalism, it will always be kind of pushed as a more technical kind of job. And so the work of, of moving forward into being leaders in the profession and taking charge of the profession is critical work for making teaching into a profession itself. It's just, it's at the heart of it. Okay. Can I follow on that? Just um, I think that's outstanding um, points, and it, it does connect with ministry because um, we've seen in our field for at least 20 years, and this may just be as long as they've been able to identify it, there are two main factors that they can see with ministers who are, have successful ministries. However that's defined, it is a bit subjective, but there are ways to look at it, and one is dedication to ongoing professional development and learning and staying connected with your colleagues. So, yeah, so I would think for many, uh, um, and I do think obviously teachers and pastors uh, at their best have a lot in common. 
So I just wanted to highlight that. And you know, the most famous book about teaching, uh, not most famous, but a very famous book about the, te the culture of teaching and teaching, written in 1975, school teacher, is, is about how the teacher at that point was an isolated, like, a, they call it the egg crate theory. You work in your own little classroom, you don't talk with other people. And since that time, there has been a whole lot of change um, to push against that. And we're, so we're, there has been movement, but there's still a lot way to go. You know, that, that, that culture still persists, that idea of the teacher still persists. I'm gonna let Jason be the you have this. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I was teach Kira's first and second grade teacher. <laughs> and mentor. <laughs> and um, and um, part of a teacher network that's been meeting since 1978. Um, <laughs> we had a meeting Thursday. I couldn't be there. I understand there were only four people there. But those people were there because they wanted to work on an issue together. And um, it's, it's really remarkable that the group doesn't end, that people who have participated in it continue to want to participate in it. And it's completely teacher-led. I, I want to get to the issue of making um, because I have the sense that you've been talking about older kids, um, mm. where there was wood shop and mm -hmm. home ec. And I think it's really a shame that there aren't those things any longer. My lifelong interest in fiber started in junior high school when I had to make a bag for my apron and whatever else it was that I had to make. Um, the dire, I think even more dire than that, is the fact that little children are not being encouraged to make things. Mm -hmm. That when I left, teaching 16, 17 years ago, I left my, the blocks that were in my first and second grade classroom, <clears throat> I don't know what's happened to them. Uh, but I know that most kindergartens don't have blocks and that many kindergarten children work on worksheets or uh, games that are created by, you know, computer games, things like that. So, um, well, that's, that's what I mean, just, just it's the absence of any kind of creative activity that allows for conversation, for problem solving, for the sorts of things that making allows, building community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where to go from there, but I just, it's a descriptive thing that I've done, but it's a great concern of mine. So. Do you want to? Uh, so, uh, currently I work at this. Yeah, um, I'm actually in the early childhood department for the school district of Philadelphia. I'm, I'm there on a two-year grant to actually help them increase the on-time kindergarten registration rate. But there's been a lot of investment in um, transforming classrooms to do more of that, like dress-up space, and I know now, but. Um, What? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, depending on, like what, because uh, I used to, yeah, it's cyclical depending on who's in charge and to, yeah, yep, yeah. I was a first grade teacher and phonics wasn't even, but that was, I taught in Miami. I'm sorry. So anyway, I was just saying that that is really important and crucial and that is where we're like getting investment and funding um, and that's with the Summer Literacy Institute too is how to start teaching again with those tools and stuff. Mm. So there's been a lot of investment in some schools and the hope is to keep on increasing that with the dress up corner, with like the blocks, with big textbooks and um, in the K-3 literacy perspective. So, um, yes, uh, but I'm saying that's a really important point and um, just that at the school district, that is an investment too. Um, and I, I, w I wanna say one other thing. I know mom wants to speak. Um, I, I, what was interesting to me about how the maker movement moved into education and how teachers 
took it up and they did, there are un elementary ed teachers who created like the maker space in their classroom, right, which is basically like the choice center or whatever, right, um, is that movement, because it had so much power and so much buy-in and legitimacy uh, from the powers that be, uh, kind of allowed them to do what they had always wanted to do. And it was very kind of strategic in, in what I, in my view, in some ways it was like, oh, first of all, they're going to allow me to do this thing that I wanted, that I think is important, because if I call it a makerspace, they'll, they'll be happy with me. And second of all, there's a network of people who are all doing this, so why don't I reach out to them and let's kind of, let's just get together and figure out how to do this thing, right? So um, I, I think that I know probably, if you're a teacher, you have probably been in a situation where uh, you, there's the prescribed approach, which you don't think is necessarily very helpful, because oftentimes this prescribed approach is about teaching to the test, right? And not, you know, and then there's the approach where you think is gonna be healthy for your students and is gonna help them grow as people and as future citizens and as learners. And um, it's very hard to push back against institutional bureaucratic kind of systems. And sometimes you gotta work the system. If it, in, in those cases, the, the power has come from this bigger movement that you know, has created some legitimacy around it. So I think it's interesting how it's take, how, it, how teachers have been very creative in figuring out what's the thing, how do I use that to do what I think is important for kids, you know? And then it's become, it, it kind of works its way in a spiral, right? They, they, okay, that works for me. Oh, I'm really actually interested in this movement. Let me kind of pull, pull that in, so. Uh, I'm happy to be Kira's mother and, um, <laughs> wanted to make two points. Uh, the first is that when Kira was in first grade, her first grade teacher, Lynn Streep, had the children do a gingerbread house village where the, the children not only made the gingerbread house and decorated, but the fences and the people, and it was a big deal. I still have the design for that gingerbread house, and we will be making one in a week with the children from the neighborhood. Uh, and we didn't call it, they, I never heard the term makerspace, but I know the impact that had. And people still come up to me when they've been to one of our gingerbread house parties saying, my kids never forgot that. So I just, you know, having, bringing that back to the early, ch the younger kids and those kind of activities, in my view, is, is, is so important. Um, connecting to that cre uh, creativity. But I did want to say one other thing. I started teaching at community college myself several years ago, and I'm not a teacher, I'm a lawyer, and I didn't know what to do. How do you, what, and I had to consult my daughter about <laughs> how do you make a curriculum, and what do you do, and how do you think, and she helped me think, well, what, are, what do you want the uh, students to walk away with, what are your objectives, and to develop a plan. And uh, there's one thing I, I'll never remember is, you c I'm teaching immigration law, which is not the most, you know, engage, engage it, it can be very technical. But through advice from my daughter, the first class, I had everybody do an immigration biography whether they had somebody in their family, they do immigrants, and they had to share it with each other. And it set the tone for an interactive class that was very different than just someone giving root knowledge. And to me, that is the challenge of teaching. And if you can use some of these devices to have that happen, that's great. So thank you for your time. It's not a question, but thank you for your consultations. Thanks, Mom. Um, and I would say one of the things that Lynn did uh, with that gingerbread is that she didn't just keep it in their classroom, she sent home the recipes, right? That's a big part of it is the networking, that it's not just the egg crate, but you're reaching out. And that transformed our family. Okay, I have the, can I sit? <laughs> um, I'm Georgianne Fong and I'm a member here and I'm also a longtime teacher and administrator. I am retired from the Philadelphia School District and uh, I'm still teaching part-time at a private school. Um, what I find uh, 
is what I think of the classroom is what you talk about, the egg crate theory, where there's still so many of us who'll be in the classroom on our own and we don't have communication skills. Um, and because we're always, we usually are in the model telling other people what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, children, though that's not supposed to be what we're always doing, we're still doing that. So I find that so many teachers, so many of us, don't really have the skills to communicate and it definitely, this goes back to the very basis of, and now since we don't have communication skills, um, we're, we come off defensive if we're questioned on anything and then we're given this new tool and we can just blast anybody we want because we don't have communication skills. Um, and I think, in my mind, there's a, probably a correlation between why those of us, many women, in our own little classrooms, um, have not had a whole lot to say in what's going on. Because one of the reasons in communication is we're very good about complaining we're very good about talking to people who, who can't make changes, who can't help us. And even as we're looking at the badass teachers, it's funny that uh, they are putting down people they're hearing from, but what we're finding, right, is no one's listening to anybody. And maybe we're making fun of people, but are we listening to them? And where is our intent? is the intent of the people, and believe me, I've, you know, you, you hear me when I was talking to you, there's a lot of what I think are s stupid things coming down from school districts and, you know, no child left behind and all of that. Mm -hmm. But if we put our mind, not that these people are against us, but that we all have the best intentions, even if that isn't true, if we believe that people have the best intentions, I think our communication would be better and it comes right down to that before we start with all the technology. I think that little piece, learning how to communicate um, effectively, and I mean taking communication classes because most of us were not trained that way in our homes. Um, I think that we would move along faster and more effectively and continue to move on as we learn to communicate effectively. So the um, transformative teacher educator fellowship that I've launched, uh, the, uh, the mission being to transform teacher education, in my vision the transformation is that in addition to learning what to teach and how to teach, teachers learn how to connect and organize, right? To empower themselves and their students. That's the third strand I think is missing. Of course, that's the that's the main. Yep, but you know the first thing is breaking out of that mindset of the egg crate model. A lot of us, yeah. Can I go now? Yeah. So everybody, I'm 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 Reed, the guy that was you talked about in the book. And first of all, I just want to say like an honor to like for you to honor the voices of teachers and the stories of teachers, and thank you, but also I wanna share with you like the impact your book is having. So on Wednesday, I was Google hanging out with undergraduate students at M Michigan State University. They read your book and they were like, they emailed me and were like, oh, we're trying to be teacher advocates and we're like, we're, these are like brand new, like, they don't know anything about teaching as such, but like they want to start off with the frame of like being networked already. They want to, they want to start off by, uh, you know, how do we connect with the community? They're, they're going in education with this in mind. And so like your book is having an impact. Um, yeah. And so it's like, it's impacting me personally. So I just want to, I just want to say thank you. And Thanks, I did kind of want to talk or listen more about your plans for the uh, the fellowship? Because I want to obviously uh, spread spread the word. Yeah. You're kind of teasing at it, but if you could like go into it a little bit more, like. Sure. Are you? I can talk about. Yeah, building schools. Like, is it like looking at cohorts at schools? Um, you know, and then outside of Philadelphia, that kind of thing. Yeah. 
So my vision is I, I feel like um, we need a little work in teacher education itself. Um, and so I'm calling, I'm putting a call out to other teacher educators uh, like me who want to kind of think together about how to transform um, teacher education, particularly around this area of building relationships, networking, community. Um, and so we are starting, it, it's a year-long fellowship. It starts in the summer. There's a seven-day um, kind of um, summer institute. The first four days, we're going to be bringing in a lot of folks to run workshops that kind of inspire. I think one of our guests here, Lynette, is <laughs> leading one of the workshops. Um, but a lot of the workshops will be on things related to topics in the text. Um, and, but it's really coming from other teacher educators, so we're bringing more people together. My other plan is, and I haven't really reached out to groups yet because it's really early on, but I'm really hoping that I can invite teacher or networks and organizers to come and join us for like dinner, to like just mingle and talk about what's happening so that they can really see, you know, it's not just, you know, reading a book or that kind of thing, but they can really see and meet and, and, and be a part of that. And the next, second half of it is they're doing work to revise their own syllabi. So taking a syllabus, I need to do that with my syllabus, you know, <laughs> taking a syllabus, revising it, figuring out how can we take some of these ideas, concepts, and rework our stuff. And then we'll spend the year um, implementing that uh, in our classrooms, checking in with each other. It's teacher research, right? Um, doing the research on, on what, what the effects are collectively. Um, and by the end, we'll kind of probably have a published volume of all of our kind of work. Um, and I'm hoping that it will become something cyclical so that we'll have cohorts um, coming in. Um, and so the hope is that the get the start the conversation, get people moving on this, do the real work, um, and connect at all the levels so that it's not just happening in teacher education, but that the teachers are also talking with, the teacher educators are also understanding that they need to talk to teachers who are working in the field and who are doing this kind of, these organizings, so. I think, unfortunately, only time for one more, um, because we're going to do book sales and a little, uh, And signing. Book yeah. sales and signing, and a little goodies. Little goodies, from the high point. So, how about the time? So, my name's Maggie, and I'm not a teacher. Um, I've, I've received a whole bunch of education, some of it wonderful and some of it not so much. Um, I want to put in a brief for Foxfire Books procedure as a maker space in the social sciences history language. Um, I don't know what volume they're on now. I only own about 13 of them. But, but they're all um, the result of kids being sent out into the community to interview adults about things that the adults know or know how to do. And in terms of the culture at large, they serve several purposes, obviously teaching the kids how to, to express thoughts and write and assemble information, and also how to interview, and they also connect the generations in their local culture, and they also serve as a, um, a reservoir of the old skills. Uh, one of the things that's in Foxfire One is how to build a cart with wheels if all you own is a hammer. And, it, you know, so you can use your hammer to build a saw, and then you can use your saw, and so on. Those are skills that are disappearing. And the reason that looks important to me is that when I go into the craft store to buy raw material for stuff I like to play with, what I see more and more is kits, you know. <laughs> Kids learn by playing with the raw material. Assembling the kit by the numbers is not it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled to hear people talking about opening the space of teaching and getting away from, let me tell you how's the right way to do it. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, there's a debate in the maker community right now because more and more there are, the, the, they're commoditizing a lot of the projects and there are turning into boxes that have steps. And so there's a lot of argument about whether or not that's truly maker uh, being a maker um, it, and whether it's good for the making community or, you know, is it an easy entryway to the world that you then riff off of? You know, that's an interesting conversation right there. 
Yeah. 